This is API Case Files. Hear this message. Tune this channel. Like E.T. said. Hello, and welcome to Episode 12 of API Case Files. I'm your host, Marsha Barnhart, and the Chief of Investigations for the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations Team. API Case Files provides an opportunity to examine and discuss reports and observations of unidentified aerial phenomena and the associated interests surrounding the study of the phenomena. Our show today, produced and released in December 2017, will cover an API team discussion on several cases recently closed and several cases currently under investigation. We also talked about common misperceptions that result in UFO reports. The team discussion includes our newest API lead investigator, Savannah Dollison, and our new API director, Paul Carr, who has taken over the directorship from our founder, Professor Antonio Paris. Before getting into the show proper, I wanted to pass along a reading recommendation. API Case Files is primarily a podcast by and for fellow investigators of unidentified aerial phenomena. We like to pass along knowledge and information we've gleaned from our research in the hopes that all of us together, as a loose ad hoc association, can build up the community investigative toolbox, so to speak, to increase our ability to better determine the most probable explanation for witness reports. Most investigators in this field know that there are a lot of misidentifications that result in the generation of UFO reports, even from credible witnesses. In our team discussion today, we cover this somewhat. And what I wanted to recommend in this vein is a book entitled Blank Spots on the Map, The Dark Geography of the Pentagon's Secret World. The book is by Trevor Peglin. What occasioned me to buy this book was the information provided in Chapter 7, The Other Night Sky. Billions of dollars on classified black budget programs with no congressional oversight, no public scrutiny, and they have made the breakthrough. It's very clear. It's very clear. Very, 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 You've heard the famous quip by Donald Rumsfeld, there are known knowns, there are known unknowns. And there are unknown unknowns. Well, Chapter 7 of Blank Spots on the Map covers the known unknowns and unmasks the existence, capabilities, and locations of some of the most secret spy and intelligence gathering satellites in the night sky. Some of these satellites and the groupings in which they operate, called constellations, are most assuredly responsible for, among other things, some of the triangular-shaped UFOs that have been reported. I am not saying here that all triangular craft reported by witnesses are tricky maneuvering spy satellites. No. I am saying some most probably are. For about 10 bucks, you can download the e-copy of Blank Spots on the Map. It's a good read, mainly informing the reader about the scope of the dark world under which much of today's intelligence community operates. But more importantly, for the UFO investigator, 
It's a great repository of black ops satellite information that is largely unknown to the public. I have included a link to that book in the show notes. This is API Case Files. Now, let me segue into a case I would like to highlight that I recently investigated. The witness sighting took place in Rorotura, New Zealand, on Friday, August 11, 2017. The sighting was at 3.55 in the afternoon, New Zealand time, which is plus 13 hours UTC. The witness, a pleasant woman in her mid-forties, was open and engaging and very puzzled as to what she saw that afternoon. I called her at her home in New Zealand, and we talked at length about her sighting. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Oh, oh good. Okay, well, I'm glad you could take my call. This is Marsha. I'm calling from Michigan in the United States. Um, I wanted to give you a call and get some idea of uh, what you saw. Uh, I, of course, read your report, and I did a little bit of uh, investigation already. I, first of all, checked that it was not the International Space Station, and that was nowhere near you at that time. But I also Mm -hmm. uh, found that that quite a few of your um, local area residents... uh, happened to have spotted a large uh, meteor in the sky at that time, too. And so uh, that's why I wanted to discuss with you the exact time, because even though what you said uh, did not track with the meteor exactly, sometimes, you know, our eyes can deceive us. So I just uh, wanted to check that. And had you heard about that meteor over your area Friday? No, I hadn't. I, I actually hadn't heard anything about that, nothing in the, in the um, news or anything. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, in Friday, August 11th, a large meteor was spotted, um, and it was throughout New Zealand, and it was spotted uh, throughout oh. the country, including the West Coast, Auckland, Christchurch, Upper Hutt, North Napier, Nelson. Wow. And um, it, had, okay. it had a colorful tail and was streaking across the sky around 6 p.m. Now, I note, too... Oh that you guys have several time frames. Our time frame is on the Wellington time frame, which is right throughout the whole of New Zealand. Uh-huh. Um, so if you, you're you saying that the meteor was around about the 6, six o'clock mark, well, what I saw was way before that. So, uh-huh. yeah, I don't know. Okay. I wanted to talk to you about what it was you saw. Right. Um, I was sitting outside um, in our, on our deck, and just looking up at the clouds, um, and then I just saw this, this streak, white streaking thing. Um, it was, it was silica, sil- like a cylinder, um, just, just moving really quickly through the cloud. Um, I... I got up out of my chair because it was moving so fast. I thought, well, it can't be a plane because it was just too fast for a plane. Um, <clears throat> and then I um, I was waiting for it to come out of the cloud so I could get a better look at what it was, but it didn't come out of the cloud. Um, and then I thought, well, that was really weird. And then I just happened to look back to where I first saw it um, in the first first instance, and it was doing the same thing again. So it was like one after the other, you know, in, in sequence. But it was it was just so fast um, and really shiny. It was just a, like a streak of light just going through the cloud. Um, and it was a, it was a cylinder shape, um, quite long, but it was like it was like a cylinder cone type shape. And it, it didn't come out the cloud the second time either. It just disappeared, and I didn't see it again. So you think it looked like an actual object and not just a bright light? Oh, it was an it was an object. Definitely was an object of some sort. 
but it was it was it was definitely bright um, because I mean it was against the cloud which was pure white and it just it just you could see it so clearly through the cloud um, it was just like streaking through the cloud to the under, other end of the cloud and then it just sort of didn't come out of the end of the cloud so that was weird. And then um, I just, like I said, looked back to where it was originally, where it first originally I spotted it, and it was like it was doing the same thing again. So whether there was two or whether it was one, I don't know. But it was the same length, the same brightness, um, but it happened in sequence. So it was like one after the other. How much time elapsed between the two sightings? Um, Only a couple of seconds. A couple of seconds, Uh uh-huh. Yeah. Now, did it make any sound? Did you hear any boom or was there any fft or any, no. any noise? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How high would you say it was? How high do you think it was in the sky? Um, I did ask my husband to give me an idea um, what sort of distance we would be looking at, and he said probably ten to 15,000 feet in the air. Uh, did your husband see it too? No, no, he didn't. He was at work. Uh, so it was within the cloud cover. It was. It was beautiful blue sky, and there was some really white puffy clouds in the sky. So the, the, where the end of the cloud broke, it was beautiful blue sky, which I thought would have been easy for me to, to see this object come out the other side, you know, onto the blue. But there was it just didn't come out of the cloud. Um, and there was... Like, I mean, when it started again, it, again, it didn't come out of the end of the cloud. Um, so I really don't know <laughs> what, what it was, but it was too fast for a plane. It was, um, you know, too, too bright for, I don't know. I, I'm guess, I, I just don't know what it was. That's what sort of freaked me out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, you see commercial air traffic over your area. Was it, did it fly about yes. as high as commercial traffic? Um, it probably was a bit higher than, because we have the airport not far from us. Um, yeah, I mean, it's in Rotorua. We have an airport here in Rotorua. Um, and that is like the flight path um, where that cloud was. But it, it, like I say, it was just going way too fast even for a jet. Because I was starting to doubt myself as to what I saw. and But I know what I saw. And... Um, it, it was just going way too fast for even, you know, the, the planes that come in the Rotorua, just way too fast. Yeah, I'm just trying to get some idea of how high it might have been if it was commercial traffic passing overhead, going from one place to another, not getting ready to land. I mean, that's that passenger traffic for commercial airliners is like five, six miles up in the air flying oh, through the clouds. Yeah. No, it wouldn't have been that then. <laughs> Yeah, no, it wouldn't have been commercial. I mean, but something something that happened so so quick after the first, you know, sighting, because it was like, you know, only a couple of seconds between the two. And I mean, no air traffic would be travelling that close to each other anyway, if you know what I mean. So your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, this thing, uh, this object you said was cylinder and it was reflecting light. Yeah, very, very shiny. Um, it, was, it was like... Oh, it's hard to explain. Um, it was you could so clearly see it, um, you know, moving through the cloud. Um, it was just going in a straight line, just through the cloud. Um, but it was bright, really bright, and it was fast. Much faster than commercial air traffic. Oh, definitely, definitely. Well, see, we don't we don't have international flights coming into Rotorua apart from ones from Australia. Um, but even then, when we have seen fl- um, planes coming in, they're going really slow, you know, coming into land. Um, but we don't see any of the big commercial planes because they're up a lot higher. Um, we, we can hear some, hear them sometimes, but we never see them. Um, but this one, well, what I saw, you could clearly see, um, it, like, a, like a cylinder, very shiny, very fast, moving through the cloud. Could you tell if it was about the size of an airliner, just didn't have a tail on it and stuff? It, it, oh, it's, oh, goodness. Well, when I, when I looked at my finger after I, because I thought, well, what, what length would it have been that I saw? And, um, you know, I've got a reasonably small hand, and from on your little finger... The first part of your little finger coming down from your nail, that's about the length it would have been moving through those clouds. 
it was it wasn't huge, but it was. I mean, you know, it's still a fair way away from me. So, I mean, it could have been bigger. But, you know, that's how how I met, ma- uh, managed to measure it. Um, and I said to my husband, that would be what the size I would have say I saw moving through those clouds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, cylinder, okay. And uh, so it was yeah. one right after the other just after a few seconds. Yeah, and neither came out of the cloud bank. Even though the cloud bank ended in the area it should have traversed, it never came out the other end both times. That's right. That's correct. Never came out. It, it just didn't. I didn't see it against the blue sky. I only saw it in the cloud. Hmm. Was it straight That's over correct. or was it a, a low arc? Did you have to crane your head back real far uh, to no, see this? No, I was only sitting in the chair on my deck and I just I just saw it. I didn't, you know, it was right there in in my vicinity. I could see it very clearly. Well, a cylinder-shaped object is not at all uh, unusual. There's a fair amount of UFOs that are cylinder-shaped or cigar-shaped. But it does not sound like what you saw was a meteor, and uh, so I can pretty much rule that out, even though there was lots of meteor activity. What you witnessed did not have the characteristics of a meteor. It had the characteristics of an object um, flying straight and true, uh, or you think there were two objects? Honestly, I cannot say whether there was two or whether it just double-backed on itself. I just don't know. But it was just, it was very quick after the end of the first sighting to when I saw the second sighting. So it was it was probably too quick for it to get back to this, that spot again, you know, if that's what it did. Um, so possibly there could have been two. I don't know. But I did see two definite sightings of something. So you must have kind of hung out waiting for the next one to fly by, huh? How long did you stay out there? Well, I... I I wasn't too. I was. I was sort of at an at an end to think. Well, what the heck did I just see? You know. And then I I just happened to look back to where I first saw it, and there it was again. So I wasn't hanging around to see it. I was just wondering why it hadn't come out of the cloud. Huh. Okay. Well, now have you seen odd things before? Is this a straight out of the blue, never happened before kind of experience? Um. Exactly. I've never seen anything like that before. I've seen falling stars. Um, I've seen things shooting across the sky. Um, I've seen lots of things like that, but explainable things I have seen, but not this. This is completely not explainable to me. I don't know what it was that I saw. And you didn't hear anything about this in the papers or on the news or anything? No, no, not at all. Um, I mean, I, I, you, I know what I saw, um, and it's something I've never seen before in my entire life. I'm 47 years old, and I've never seen something like this before. Um, and I believe what I saw, um, to me, is possibly um, some sort of UFO thing, you know. I don't know. Some phenomenon, anyway. Um, and, I mean, if I could, yeah, at least find out, you know, if somebody else has seen something as well, that would be a little bit more helpful, I guess. <laughs> Um, did you have any strange dreams afterwards, or did anything s- different from normal happen to you following that sighting or no. before? No, I I couldn't sleep. I know I couldn't sleep, um, but no, nothing strange happened to me. Uh, I guess it was constantly on my mind, but um, no, nothing strange happened to me. Um, yeah, which is good. <laughs> yeah. But I do know um, that there has been quite a few sightings in New Zealand um, over the last few years because um, I just went and did a bit of research myself and there has been several sightings here. So I don't know if this is, you know, possibly one of those sightings or or what, but yeah. Um, and I just I just appreciate somebody actually taking me seriously. <laughs> uh, I don't expect you to find out what it is. Um, I, I mean, you know, because I, I mean, I don't even know what I saw. So it's it's a bit hard for somebody else to determine that. And you're in a completely different country to me as well. Um, but, you know, it's just nice to be able to know that somebody, you know, is there um, and does believe what I've seen um, is something that's unexplained, out of the ordinary, you know. Um, 
So, no, if, whatever you can do, um, that's absolutely fine with me, but I do appreciate you ringing and um, that I could just explain what I did see to you. I was unable to determine an explanation for this sighting, given her detailed account. Case 17-026 New Zealand was closed as unidentified. Next up, our recent API team discussion, which was recorded during a team meeting hangout on November 6, 2017. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the investigations we've been involved in. I want to talk about some of the things that we're finding are common UFO report type issues, and I want to introduce our new lead investigator, Savannah Dollison, who is located in Oregon. So, Savannah, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your background, if you would, please, and how you got interested in this. Sure. Well, um, I think I've been with you guys for about two months now. And I found you guys by doing a Google search for interesting podcasts. Um, that's how it started. So my my interest with API started with a Google search. And then listening to the podcast um, pinged my curiosity. And I really enjoyed listening to each episode. I found the stories fascinating. Um, each episode was very cool. I remember in particular one about some guys in the desert or something that stopped at a gas station and there were like six guys that all looked exactly the same. And that's got to be one of my favorite uh, mm-hmm. stories that you guys have put on the air. So I've been interested in random uh, phenomenons, different types like supernatural phenomenons or uh, paranormal phenomenons when I was a teenager. So I did some ghost investigations when I was younger. Uh, so it's it's not out of the blue that I am interested in something that I can't explain. And that's, I think, number one for me is I'm just a curious person. And I want to learn as much as I possibly can. So the API case files is a great avenue for that. The way you guys put together your podcast, it's clear. And uh, I know that Marshy liked to use the term woo-woo. I think it's very uh, scientific-based. It's not too woo-woo for me. I got that technical term from uh, Paul, (laughs) who is a brainiac. Brainiac taught me (laughs) woo-woo. Not considered a technical term, by the way. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And I know that, you know, UFOs, that term is very taboo. We think aliens, we think extraterrestrials, we think crazy people, but really that's not what it's about. It's like unidentified flying objects. And of course, there are objects in the sky that are unidentifiable. And I like that we're just going about it, trying to identify it first. And then secondly, put together a really great system of files so that if somebody wants to study it, they can. I think it's a great system. So I'm happy to be a part of the investigative team, and I've had fun so far. Now, Savannah, um, give us a breakdown on your first case. You did a a really good job. Uh, I knew that we had the right person for the job when you uh, headed out on that. You did an excellent job. Now, give us a breakdown on that job. It took place in Oregon, yeah? It did. Well, my first case was technically that one out of Connecticut, but that was closed due to lack of witness response. Um, And so, yeah, my first case that I actually got to investigate was the one out of Cresswell, Oregon, which is about two and a half hours south of me. I live near Portland, Oregon, and the witness was fantastic. He was very easy to communicate with through email, by text. 
uh, by phone if I needed to. We quickly were able to coordinate a phone interview so I could get his full story and ask for clarification on whatever I didn't quite understand. Um, he was a super nice guy and very honest. Uh, he wasn't uh, keeping anything from me. He was. He answered all my questions and... Um, So anyways, he invited me down to Crestwell, Oregon, and I had the time to do that. So because the phenomenon was showing up every single night from anywhere from 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. when he would let his dogs out. So he would come out on the on the porch and see these objects in the sky every single night. So I was like, great, I need to get down there and see it in person. So I made the the short drive and met him, his wife. And his two dogs, who are really awesome. And we we camped out. Uh, we sat outside and we set up some lawn chairs and just sat out in the yard for a while. I think I was there for about an hour and a half. Um, I brought my digital camera and was able to get some pictures about every 30 seconds so that I could put together a time-lapse video later uh, so that I could track the movements of those objects. And it was very successful. I also had my smartphone with me, and so I was able to download the SkyMap app on my Android phone and use that to actually identify the objects. It was very simple. Uh, Anyone can download a sky map app on their phone and it turns out that these objects were just the the very brightest stars in our night sky so we're in the northwestern celestial hemisphere and our two brightest stars are two of the objects that he was seeing every night and they definitely do stick out from the other stars i could see why they would draw his attention Did you explain to the audience what you determined that the objects were that he was seeing? He was seeing these objects in the southwestern and western sky, about 30 to 40 degrees above the horizon line. And when I got there and I opened up my sky map, within two minutes of being on site, I could see that the star directly in the western sky was the star Arcturus. And... Um, Another way to identify that star, not only with the sky map, but if you look to the northern sky and can find the Big Dipper, Ursa Major, you can follow the arc of the handle and it points directly to Arcturus. So that was great to be able to do that. And then there was another object directly above our heads, another very bright star-like object. And my sky map identified that as the Vega star. Again, those are the two brightest stars in the northern celestial hemisphere. Now, what about those stars made this guy think that they were UFOs? Why do you suppose he didn't just go, hmm, maybe I should determine if those are stars? What was the phenomenon at work there? There's a phenomenon called stellar scintillation. Stellar scintillation is when you've got a a pinprick of light, like from a star, And it's traveling to Earth from very, very far away. And it has to go through our atmosphere in order to get to our eyes. So what happens when that light passes through our Earth's atmosphere is it refracts. Our atmosphere breaks that light up and kind of kicks it around a little bit. So instead of traveling a straight path from the sky to our eyes, it zigs and zags a little bit, which is sort of what twinkling is. But it can be very much more exaggerated if it's lower in the horizon. And that's where this star was that he was seeing. It was about 30 to 40 degrees from the horizon line. And so it was moving a lot more than if it's directly above your head. It has to go through a lot more atmosphere because it's at a diagonal. It was simple twinkling of stars that also, due to another phenomenon with the eye when it's looking at a bright light against a black background, also causes kind of a what you think is a perceived movement, but it's just a, um, a trick of the eye. So both those things were in effect that caused this guy to think he was looking at 
slightly moving UFOs, but they were just stars and you proved it. And that effect is the autokinetic effect. And it has a psychological component too. And so if one person looks up at the sky and says, hey, I think that that little piece of light is moving, then everyone else around you is far more likely to also think that it's moving. Yeah. Okay. So there was kind of a a shared um, experience there uh, that the main witness might have been kind of influencing whatever the other witnesses might have been seeing. Exactly. The witness was very reliable and so was his wife. Uh, They were both very happy to answer all my questions while we're there looking at the sky. I asked them, is this exactly what you've been seeing, you know, every night for the past uh, few weeks or month? And they said, yes, this is exactly what we've been seeing. And uh, so the pictures that I took showed the the time lapse movement. And you could see that these stars are, in fact, moving with their constellation and we're not moving outside of it. When you explained that to the witness, what was his reaction? Well, he thanked me for all the work that I did. I sent him a quite a lengthy report explaining everything in detail. And he said that it makes a lot of sense, but his only concern was still the amount of movement that he perceived. The amount of movement to him uh, still didn't quite fit the characteristics of a star. But I think that that's still due to the autokinetic effect that he is is uh the effect is more pronounced through his eyes and so to him i think it does appear to be moving more i don't think he's dishonest i think it's just the autokinetic effect his optical system sees that much more exaggerated perhaps than another human standing right beside him all right well that that was a really interesting case and simultaneously with your case i was doing a case in wisconsin that turned out to be the exact same thing and this kid um i was in touch with several times and you know you had just um pinged in on what you thought that was and we were discussing it and so i told this kid to load that program and ride out to where he had been seeing this same phenomenon and i never heard back from him Mm. so i think a lot of people you know every once in a while well some people when they think they've seen ufos and then they find out oh that was just a star you know they feel kind of goofy and that happens when people see venus and are certain that it's the mothership just hovering there they don't really want to own the fact that they they just got side slapped by mother nature yeah you had me when i first joined the team you asked me to find out when the international space station would be flying overhead so that i could see what that looked like and get used to seeing objects in the sky and I have to say, it was uh, it was pretty fantastic. It's a very, very bright light that moves very quickly across the sky. It's not only beautiful, but if you did not know what it was or weren't expecting yeah. it, absolutely you could identify that as a UFO. Uh huh. Okay. Well, that was a that was a really boffo good case. She just nailed it. That was excellent work. Round of applause here for Savannah, ladies Yay! and gentlemen. Yeah. Paul, you just chewed on to a real good case that you're going to have some trouble wrapping your hands around that bad boy. Yeah, that, this is a complicated case where uh, a witness began with, a, with, a, with something that we see fairly often, which is somebody noticed a very bright light in the sky. Uh, in this case, it was the wee hours of the morning. Uh, I didn't ask her why she was up at those that hour, but she was. She saw a very bright light through a window uh, towards the back of her house. And uh, she went outside and with a tripod and a camera and took a number of photographs of this, this very bright light. Plus she saw some other things. Uh, one of them she thinks may have been a star. Uh, certainly the star Betelgeuse was right there at that time. And Betelgeuse is a nice bright orangish red star when it's on the near the horizon it's really obvious. Uh, so uh, she she probably did see that star, but she saw something else and she was looking eastward and eastward means uh, the star, anything you see coming up that's astronomical should be going up in the sky, not going down. But the objects she describes are going down uh, 
over about a period, she says an hour. The photographs span about half an hour that we have. Um, and she's still looking to see if there's any more that we missed. But uh, th these were taken with a uh, a camera that's capable of 14 megapixels. The images I have are only about five megapixels. But some of these cameras have modes that are uh, where you reduce the size of the image to get more of them on the card. So I think it may have been that. And then, uh, so we have these photographs, and they're interesting. They are all four-second expo second exposure, so it's not great uh, for that perspective. Uh, even with a tripod, a four-second exposure is vulnerable to small vibrations, bumping, so forth. So you can't tell if what you're seeing is movement or if it's something else. And uh, so, well, you can tell, but it takes a lot of lot of uh, effort to try to resolve the two difference. Now, wasn't part of sometimes the sometimes you're going to be wrong, Paul? Wasn't part of the problem that part of the problem I see there that that you're going to have, you know, difficulties with is that that witness is so close to the airport there. Now, let's let's talk about that issue a little bit. Well, okay, uh, the witness is uh, a few miles north of of a major airport. Now, I went and looked carefully at the airport and, and the approach paths um, and what the witness saw come out of, to the east could not have been aircraft uh -huh. could, for several reasons. One of which, uh, you know, sometimes you do see a landing light coming at you and it's very, very bright. Uh, it, it looks extremely bright, sometimes brighter than Venus. Uh, and that will last for a few minutes, but it won't last for half an hour or or, or an uh -huh. hour. Uh -huh. and, and if it's coming at you towards the airport, it will get higher in the sky, not lower in the sky. So I, I'm, and there's no other major airport over in that direction. So I think that uh, almost certainly was not landing lights. Uh, also, the colors are not consistent with landing lights. But, uh, of course, the colors of that a camera captures uh, in a force exposure can be distorted somewhat. But uh, so I have these images. And that sort of kicked off the investigation, looking at these pictures and trying to understand what was going on there. Uh and then I was, the witness told me that there had been a, quite a number of other sightings, including one uh, very close to the airport, uh, probably less than a mile from the runway. Uh, and what had been seen at that point was a, a an orb-like thing, and I have a sketch of this uh, that she made, flying in very rapidly pausing over an aircraft that was coming into land and sort of following the aircraft for a way, for a ways and then darting off. Uh, it's described as, as a very sort of gossamer rippling, not particularly well-defined orb. Uh, and then, uh, so that led me to file a FOIA request for the radar data for the airport. And also I have uh, found the, the audio for, which is online. It's available. You can get audio, uh, archived audio. I don't know how long they keep it, but uh, if you go to uh, uh, liveatc.net, they have archives of both tower and approach departure audio. Uh, and I'm going to play a little bit of audio. I, I went through, I went through a lot of audio, and it's mostly very, very dull stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's. And a lot of it, I had to look, I had to do a lot of uh, searching to find out what they were talking about. Uh, now, this this incident took place on Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th of October. Friday the 13th on October. So you found that that audio from the ATC tower at the time frame, she thought? No, this was actually, well, the, the tower audio, I could not find anything interesting in. Now, the tower uh, only takes over... Uh, when the aircraft is very close okay. to the uh, uh -huh. to the runway, mm -hmm. uh, at that point the aircraft's already been assigned its runway, uh, and um, it's initially it it will they'll contact uh, Cleveland Approach, and then there's a different frequency at which they talk to the tower, and you'll hear many times in the in the approach recordings he'll say uh, okay now. Uh, Go talk to the tower at this frequency, and uh, but and, and the exchanges are all very brief, as you'd expect, because you know you don't have a lot of time to talk, and 
uh, there's no, nobody gets chatty on the on these right. uh, yeah. th- these can- these channels. What'd you What'd you find? Well, I found one thing that interested me that took place uh, about ten minutes in to the time frame that the witness thinks the event occurred, mm. uh, and I'll play it for you now. It's very brief. Uh, hold on, here we go. We off Kilo Roger. You still have traffic at twelve o'clock and uh, less than a mile southbound. Less uh, shown two thousand two hundred. Uh, the the, uh, the approach controller very calmly mentions traffic at 12 o'clock at about 2,000 feet uh, and less than a mile away. Now, uh, if I went, when I went through those recordings, that was the only mention of traffic. Because when you're in that approach area for an airport with what they call the Bravo airspace, there's not supposed to be any traffic that isn't authorized. Uh, and as close as they were in, uh, they were in the area that, the the air the uh, airport has complete control of from eight thousand feet down to the surface, so uh, the uh, the the Bravo what they call the Bravo area is, is like this inverted wedding cake, where you have this area close to the airport and then you go up a higher altitude and it's further away from the airport and so on, uh, up to about ten thousand feet and uh, nobody should be in that area without clearance. Okay, I have a question here now. So you put in a FOIA report for the FAA, and they're going to send you, in addition, a data disk that shows where planes were at a specified time, right? And you're going to be able to, you should be able to match up uh, the time frame on that disk they send you, and you can see the uh, call signs of different planes. And you should be able to see if there was any object that was in the area that is talked about on that audio bit you got, right? Well, right? if the object didn't have a transponder, I'm not sure what that'll look like. But because because all these planes that all these planes in the Bravo area are required to have transponders, so uh, and they all do. And uh, so normally things are very orderly. You know, there, there's a plane coming in to land on, on the on the runway, and then there's another plane miles behind it, and so on. And this just goes this. They keep this regular rhythm going, and uh, this is a very, this is a pretty busy airport. Not you know not uh, Chicago O'Hare, but it's still pretty busy. And it, it uh, so there, there's a regular flow of traffic into the airport, and everybody has to be under the to even enter into that that area. You have to get permission to go in. Yes, but you will see traffic. You will see traffic on that data disk that does not have corresponding data that tells what that uh, flight is, what its altitude is. You you will see little dots of things, probably. I mean, I did on mine that did not have any corresponding information with them. They're, you know, smaller planes. I don't know how much they're tracked when they're just puddling from one little place to another. Well, the smaller planes aren't supposed to go into that area uh, unless they uh, they they're above the altitude for that control area, or below the altitude, uh, so there there's a you can fly under this inverted wedding cake, or you can fly over it, but or around it, but you're not allowed to go into it without clearance. Given where the witness says the plane was, and and by the way, we don't know which airline it was, um, we don't know very much about it at all. That. The the plane may have, and it may have been a private aircraft, not a airliner, but this mention of traffic is the only one I could find. I've mentioned a traffic in that in all those tapes, and that if I can line that up with with what was going on at that time on the radar, then I might be able to find something that would corroborate what the witness said. Now, the plane often will uh, use its call signs and the tower will use call signs on incoming traffic. So if you listen back to find that, might you get the call signs off the uh, well, the dialogue? Yeah, maybe. Uh, the problem is, uh, is the ambiguity. There's a lots of them. I think the call sign was uh, the, the call sign of, of a private aircraft. So I don't know the air. So it may not. It, it may be one, one of these like corporate jets or something. Uh, and the sketch certainly doesn't seem to indicate a very large plane, uh, but the sketch is, you know, it's a sketch. It's not, uh, and it's drawn from memory. Yeah, a lot of those little small um, planes that are not commercial planes, private planes, don't have that that uh, tracking technology on them. They will soon, probably all of them will, but some well, don't. Well, if, if you're going to land at this particular airport, you have to have a transponder. Oh, Okay. 
But right. uh, yeah, okay. Uh, and if it's like a corporate jet, it would certainly have that. That you know, uh -huh. those very yeah. expensive aircraft uh, per passenger. Uh, so this looks like a pretty good case so far. You got a little something to go on. Now it's going to be, um, it's going to be a real continuous chase on your uh, FOIA. Yeah, well, I think the, the FOIA the FOIA was an interesting education for me, and I, I yeah. Uh, you pointed me to this person in Fort Worth. I had to call. Right, right, right. I, I called good. her. I called her. She called me back, uh, mm -hmm. and we talked. And she sort of stepped me through the process. Uh, they have a website you can go for the FAA where you can you can step through the FOIA form, and then what it does is it creates a a letter that goes into the system. And uh, so that was uh, that's been filed, uh, and you know. We may learn nothing from that, but it, for me, it was you know just uh, the first time I'd done an FAA FOIA request, so I I, I uh, thought it was, and I've been learning a lot about the airport and about how pilots talk to the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is only one tiny bit of this uh, this particular witness's case. I think I'm going to try to focus on this primary these two these two incidents primarily. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, she's got lots of others. Uh -huh. uh, and this is something we do see from time to time, a, a witness who just sees things a lot and they're mm -hmm. all different mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. all, uh, they're all strange. And I am told that there are other witnesses who are at this point, not willing to come forward. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm hoping that with a little bit of time, we can get those other witnesses to come forward. Uh, mm -hmm. a, as you know, uh, we protect witness anonymity uh, very rigorously. Yeah. Uh, and we do not give away any details of where a person lives or uh, mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. contact information. Yeah. So uh, uh, I'm hoping that people will realize, will, will trust us on that and come forward, and we can get some additional corroboration of, of what this particular witness has seen. Uh, and uh, there's also a child, but the child is too young, I think, to uh -huh. be uh, a witness. So. Yeah, that that's going to take a while for you to dig through. But now, you know, I just finished a case in Idaho that I wanted to mention. And this this is an interesting one because I really had to struggle with that. Are you with us, Savannah? Yes. Now, here was a case that, that was kind of similar to yours in a way, Paul, in that your witness has a habit of going out and looking in the skies and looking for things. My witness had a habit of going out in the skies and looking for things. And there were multiple interesting aspects to this. One, the woman actually was certified as mentally ill because she had bipolar. And two, she kept saying, look, I am not crazy. I am seeing these things and others are too. And, you know, so I'm struggling with just because somebody is bipolar, uh, it doesn't mean that everything they see, they're crazy. But unless you can get corroboration, you have to kind of assume that what they're seeing might not be real. So darned if she didn't have four people I talked with that had been there with her uh, and had seen some things that I, I couldn't rule them out. They were objects that move in a way that would be very, very bizarre, you know, like a ball of light that just appears and then goes and then comes back or um, a triangular formation that she and another witness saw. So I talked to people who corroborated having been with her, having seen some of these things. And so I could not then, in good conscience, say that this was all a case of mental illness. I do know that she had, because she was very heightened in her interest in UFOs, one, she said that she called for them to come around her which I didn't think was a very smart idea in case that is such a phenomenon. Two, she was sending me pictures of things that I know were pareidolia. You know, here you'll see a face here. Well, I didn't see a face there. So there was the mental illness. There was the pareidolia. There was the extreme interest in the UFO subject. And there was the fact that she kept saying, look, honest, please believe me, I'm not crazy. Well, all these things kind of set you off little alarms. But I, I had to default to giving some credence to what she said because of corroborating witnesses. And if you can get some corroboration from other witnesses, Paul, 
all, you understand that is exceedingly important. You have to have other people who say uh, that they have seen these things with this person, right? Right. And it, it helps if they're independent, but that's extremely rare. Uh, yeah. uh, usually it's it's a close relative or friend. Well, I I think in a lot of our cases, having looked down through the case loads recently, uh, I wanted to discuss a little bit now, if we could, about the typical things people are seeing and reporting that may or may not turn out to be anything of import. Now, we already know that there's a lot of cases of pareidolia, and we know there are cases of shared pareidolia. Um, you can prove shared pareidolia when you lay down on a cloudy day and you see a cloud go by and it looks like a poodle. And you say to your friend, geez, that looks like a poodle, right? Yeah, it does. Oh, yeah. Oh, now it's turning into a giraffe or whatever. So you can share pareidolia. And I think Savannah may have seen that a little bit uh, with her case. So that shared pareidolia thing I was not expecting to to run into in a case for UFOs, but I see that it is occurring. Another thing that has been occurring a lot, taking a look at much of the caseload, even those people who don't want to have their sighting investigated, I am seeing a lot of people writing that the UFO is disguising itself as a star. And I, I'm finding that interesting because we do know there are cases of this, this stellar scintillation where people are seeing actual stars and they think they're UFOs. But I'm also finding uh, in my reading and research and some of the other cases, and that was this case that I told you about, uh, it was an Idaho case with this woman who had other people see these, that this girl would go out with the woman and they would look at the stars and this girl next to this woman would say, I'll bet you that is not a star, it's a UFO. And darn if it wouldn't go, Voot! and off it would go. So I'm noticing this more and more. Have you seen or read much about that, either of you? No. I mean, I've always we've always had lots of people that misidentified stars and planets. Yeah, uh, but it's usually a very a fairly simple misidentification. It's not uh, this notion that uh, you know stars go whipping off now. Well, I'll tell you, having read recently this book uh, by Trevor Peglin, you know, I'd mentioned that to you. There is a whole chapter in that book that deals with up until this point, at least, what was secret spy satellites sent up by the alphabet agencies, and that one of these spy satellites flies in a constellation in threes, and that they're mm -hmm. quite certain that these three satellites that are flying along are those spy satellites, and people are seeing that and thinking it is a triangular craft. And when you're looking up in a dark sky, as we know, it's very difficult to determine the altitude of that object you're seeing. It could be very, well, very... It, I, would, I would go further and say it's impossible. Yeah. Unless you have some reference object that it flies in front of. Right. Yes. Yes, it's impossible. So the fact of the matter is that there's actual spy craft up there of of um, satellites that fly in constellations. And you probably know this, Paul, because you're working with that. Yeah, there there are there are some there are some constellations that are uh, uh -huh. in the open world as well, a and uh, they they do occasionally get seen. There are people whose major hobby is going out and looking for satellites, and uh, and they've seen these things. Yeah, people are witnessing these things, thinking they're UFOs. Well, people witness these things knowing they're satellites too. Uh huh. Uh, Traveling in uh, groups. I don't think most of John Q. Public realizes I didn't until I read this because I remember seeing two st two satellites traveling together one time uh, since I've lived here in Cadillac. And I had, I thought, what is it I just saw? Because they, there was two and then one disappeared and then the other disappeared. And those were probably satellites that, that caught the glint of the sun and one zipped and lost the glint before the other one was. But I didn't realize that satellites fly in constellations oh, yeah. of twos yeah, and well, threes and fours and fives and eights. The, yeah, it's a, the, the larger ones tend to be fairly loose constellations where they're, they'll take uh, you know quite a long time 
between the first one and the last one, uh-huh. but other, others fly much tighter constellations. Uh-huh. Uh, you'll see more. You'll see more of those in the future, I think. Yeah, well, um, it's important that people understand that because uh, there's more and more UFO reports, as you know. It's there's been a lot all, more. All the all the satellites in that case will all move in a satellite like way, you know, in a straight, in a pretty much a straight arc across the sky and they'll stay close together they won't separate out or or come in quickly yes but uh, what of those that are in a geosynchronous orbit and they're in a constellation and they've just been uh they've been ordered by their handlers to make a adjustment in uh where they're sitting and so that which had appeared to be a star because it's geosynchronous now suddenly goes doink and another one next to it goes doink well, the thing is, uh, people have been flying geosynchronous satellites in tight constellations for decades, and um, it's called co-location. They're quite far away, and they're very hard to see with the naked eye. Maybe with a good pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you can see them, uh-huh. but uh, they're not going to move quickly. They're, they, even if they do a maneuver, uh, it's going to be very, very unlikely you'll see it. Uh, what you could see a geosynchronous, geosynchronous satellite if it was tumbling, mm-hmm. and then its shiny surfaces are now facing towards you know, and you'll see a flash of light as as the shiny surface, uh, this it is just the right angle so the sun reflects off of it back to you, uh-huh. kind of like an iridium flare except much further away, and uh, it won't be anywhere near as bright as an iridium flare but you could see it. But geosynchronous uh, satellites are at an altitude of about thirty six thousand kilometers. Mm-hmm. Compare that to the space station, it's 400 kilometers high, and it could be high, further than that from you. But Well, I work in miles, and that's so that the International Space Station is about 240 miles up. So right. and these yeah. and so we've got these uh geosynchronous satellites are way, way out there. They're they're um some of those are out in the exosphere. I mean that's out there. Well, they're they're at uh about almost quite almost not but not quite seven Earth radii away from the earth. Mm. So mm. it's if you drew the circle it would be seven times larger than the diameter of the earth that they they mm. move in. So in this in this vein of the th- talking about the things that are commonly mistaken for UFOs and anomalous experiences there is a very large bag and added to that bag just recently as you know Paul through some email we just had is the Google loon right. balloons. Now they're flying two and three in a little group of two yeah. and three. Well, yeah, right now they're flying over Puerto Rico and I think there's several of them. Yes. They figured out how to keep them more or less stationary yeah. over a long periods of time right. without need of tether. Um, now, when I was a kid growing up in East Texas, we had a, a NASA facility near us that flew high altitude balloons and we'd frequently see them. Uh, it, it, it looked just like a really bright light in the sky. Uh, and, but we all knew what it was because they already told the local media that we'll be flying a balloon tomorrow. And so look for that bright light. You'll see it. But we're seeing a lot more of those. If you aren't informed and you didn't, you didn't catch the local media report and you're just going about your business and you aren't paying too much attention about what's going on with high altitude scientific balloons, you take a look up at the sky and you see these three white orbs up there floating around, essentially not moving. That kind of freaks you out and that generates reports. I know that those same balloons, when they were testing the Project Loon, they were flying them over New Zealand. Now they're flying them over for real real world uh, application beaming down um, LTE signals to the ground. Now they're flying around real world in Puerto Rico and someplace else. Uh, So they're using them when infrastructure has been interrupted from some conflagration. So that's pretty interesting to see. That's another thing. So these loon balloons that are flying two and three and four uh, abreast or in a triangular or some type of formation 12 miles up moving slowly appear to be stationary. Yeah. So we've got that on the docket that is going to be generating reports. And when you get a report and you start working a lead case, then you hit some of the reporting sites like New Fork, National UFO Reporting Center. You start taking a look at some of these reports and some of them you can tell probably are the International Space Station flying over, probably are stellar scintillation, probably are uh, high altitude balloons that have been seen, um, probably are known celestial things. And it, the only time I pay attention to 
these reports really are when they do an unusual movement like a zap and that light didn't just disappear because any satellite can blink out. It just traversed across the sky, you know, so fast that it's impossible to comprehend. That gets my attention. And when other things, and I think this witness of yours might have said this, Paul, that she at some time witnessed an orb dropping some type of material out of it. Uh, that gets my attention. Yes. Uh, well, one of the very first cases I worked with, that was a report like that. I, I can't figure that one out yet. Well, um, I, th- I thought that he, that particular witness might have seen uh, some re-entering space debris and just misinterpreted it. But, uh, you know, if you take his testimony literally, mm-hmm. it's not that. But the problem is you yeah. have to kind of learn what, when people are going from memory that they, they sometimes inflate the size of things and so forth. Yeah, I've read numerous reports, though, of that particular UFO phenomenon where this a couple of lights will show up and they will hover there and drop out other little lights that will go down to the uh, near ground level and they see them floating about in the forest at night and then come back up and join this thing sometime. That That's a head-scratcher. Yeah, now, I, I did see once uh, a video posted that uh, showed a very bright light sort of disintegrating and dropping down to the ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we figured out before very long that that was a uh, air-to-air target over a military reservation that had been hit by an aircraft operating at night. You couldn't see, the, you couldn't see much going on. Except this very bright light, which just gets hit and then just starts, starts, uh, starts falling to the ground in bits and pieces, and uh, you know it looks really. But it doesn't. It doesn't start falling back up. When it starts falling back up, then we got ourselves a conundrum. It won't. It won't go back up. Uh, the, once the pieces start to fall, they're going down, and, and of course, there's a lot of flares that that are dropped over military reservations as well. And there's an awful lot being tested around numerous sites that, you know, are black sites or gray sites uh, that are testing uh, capabilities that we do not have a clue about because we're not supposed to. And uh, we don't know a thing about what's going on. And some of those are generating UFO reports, too. Nonetheless, I maintain there is still something to the UFO phenomenon, but our job is to take a witness report and try to figure out what was most probably witnessed. And if we can't, we can't. Basically, it's about collecting the facts. And in most cases, once you have all the facts together, combined with the witness testimony, it'll uh-huh. be clear what it was, but not every time. And yeah, yeah. sometimes that's because, uh, for example, this UK case that I have right now, I think the main reason I can't do much with it is I just don't. The objects are very, very tiny. They're very, very distant, and they're probably they could be lots of things. And I just can't really resolve it. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is is probably <laughs> over the Irish Sea somewhere. So it's just one of those cases where you all, it's all you say is, "Yeah, there's something there," and it's not moving in a way that's yeah particularly anomalous. It's not doing anything anomalous. It's just there. And uh, so you know, what is that? Well, we don't know. Uh, yeah, that's that's an insufficient data type of thing. Uh, that That is a problem every once in a while, in addition to the fact that, as Savannah found out with her first case, some people just won't get back with you, and so the witness is just not cooperating. They say they want an investigation into their case, but when they understand that it means that they have to actually answer questions, they aren't all that interested in it, so you just have to close with the witness just wasn't cooperative. Now, Savannah, you just got a new case. This will be your third case. What can can you tell us about that so far? Yeah, so I actually have an interview scheduled two days from now with that witness, and he so far is highly cooperative. I asked him to send me some sketches of what he saw throughout the night, and he has uh, sent me two sketches. Um, I'm interested in what you guys have been talking about so far about satellites moving in formation. Um, what the witness described was three orb-like or star-like objects moving across the sky in formation, two of them were moving together and then a third one showed up to make a triangle formation. 
and they they watch the phenomenon for about five minutes on Halloween in the night sky. Uh huh. That is exactly the type of operation that I just recently read about in the spy satellites from that book I was telling you about uh, by Trevor Peglin. That that there will be several satellites that are over an area or moving over an area, and then they bring another one in because it has a different capability that they want to marry to the capability of what they already have. So in the world now, that is plausible that it's actual satellites and not uh, woo-woo. What do you think, Paul? Well, also, the spa- when a space station has a, uh, a supply ship or a cruise ship coming up to dock with it, uh-huh. you will see two. Yeah very bright lights in the sky. One might be the uh, SpaceX Dragon, mm-hmm. or it might be uh, any of a number of other uh, vessels that are designed to deliver cargo or crew. So suffice it to say, at this point in time, we have something that would answer exactly what Savannah's witness has so far said they saw in the night sky. It doesn't mean that's what it is. But, you know, if you're going to look at, okay, what's most probable? Probability is something that that really tends to be more about what you're more likely to believe than it is actually any calculation of how likely it is. But uh, it's just a question of uh, Occam's razor. That is, can you explain it in terms of something you already know exists? If you can, then you don't have to explain it in terms of something you're not sure exists. Yeah. Now, Occam's razor is not a hard and fast rule of logic. It's just simply a a good rule of thumb for determining whether something is... uh, a better explanation. Yes, and that that's operational and works real good unless the person who's applying Occam's razor keeps wanting to skirt their data uh, to fit Occam's razor as opposed to fit what was actually witnessed and reported. And that's a problem we, you know, we run into every once in a while. But are there other things that you uh, guys think we might want to discuss here uh, as a segment? Well, should we talk about Antonio? Yes. Now, as people may or may not know, Antonio was our original director. He formed the group back in Washington, D.C., Annapolis, Baltimore, Maryland region in late 2011. And so uh, he had been running it until just recently. And so what was his decision? Well, Antonio uh, decided last summer that he had too many irons in the fire and he really couldn't continue uh, with UFO investigation anymore. Antonio left the area a few years ago to move to Florida, uh, and uh, he has taken on a lot of new things since then, including uh, a disaster relief effort in Puerto Rico. So he uh, has uh, decided that he just really, he had to give something up, and he decided to give up running API. And uh, so we decided to continue for now, uh, as we were pretty much, taking cases and investigating them and filing reports. There will be some small changes, I think, to how we operate and how we share data with the public, but nothing really major. And we are looking to ally with other small independent groups that maybe want to share information and sort of share training and training help and, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, who can perhaps handle a case better if it's in their area rather than one of our areas. Uh, we used to all be in Maryland. Uh, and Antonio was really good at getting the word out mm-hmm, mm-hmm. at getting us before the public and also recruiting people. And because we were all local, we could meet face to face on a re- on a regular basis, which we did and share information there. And uh, so we went, made a lot of little trips down to Annapolis where Antonio and uh, his family live. Um, and we, we miss his, Antonio's energy and his ability to get the, word out and get the you know get us before the public is his ability to get on social media and just Yeah, he really was he was a great promoter. There was no doubt about that. He was a real good promoter. Yeah, and 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 I am not I am not anywhere near as good at that as he is. Uh he also what he also what he brought to the table the reason I joined was that uh Antonio did have some professional experience doing investigations for you know US government and that mm-hmm. uh was something I wanted to know more about and learn learn the ropes of. Yeah. And so he did show us some of the things he learned there. Uh, his energy and his his uh, ability to deal with the public are missed. But we'll keep moving. And, and uh, again, alliances with other groups, especially groups that have uh, a charismatic leader that who can, who can uh, stir up 
and, and direct reports our way is really what we want. We don't need a ton of reports. Mm -hmm. I think right now, if we get five or six a month, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that's workable. And I think uh, we could maybe take one more investigator on sometime soon. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We don't want to be big. We don't want to be the next, uh, you know, we don't want to be a behemoth. Uh, it just, we don't have the resources. Uh, now, one of the other thing that Antonio was good at was was scaring up money. He would go out and, and get little bits of money, and we and we were going go on these little field trips. Uh, that may happen again, but right now we're not. Uh, we are operating on a shoestring. Pretty much everybody paying their own expenses, so we don't have membership dues. We we just have, uh, you know, we try to do things as cheaply as we can, and and uh, if you have to, you know. You pretty much have to provide your own gas money and your own, uh, you know, whatever other expenses you have. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, but another thing, good thing about everybody being in Maryland, I got Maryland cases on a regular basis, which I was able to drive out to see the witness, and and it hasn't happened in a while, and I I miss yeah. that, and uh, actually going on site. So if you're in Maryland and you're listening, uh, report a UFO dot org, or uh, we have a hotline number, uh, which you can call. And, uh, you know, if if you're in law enforcement and you you know somebody you, and you occasionally get these kinds of reports into your station, you can direct them to us, particularly if you're in Maryland, Michigan or Oregon. So, yeah, it'd be nice if we had an investigator in California because there's an extraordinary amount of reports from California. But um, our Oregonian there, Savannah, will... We'll take care of that as best she can, but you know, yeah, we don't we don't have the resources to uh, put on our gear and and hop on our horse and head out and do a on site field investigation really very often. Now, if some if somebody wants to drop a little coin on us to help us do that, <laughs> we're not going to turn turn you away. <laughs> but uh, at present, uh, you know, I I would you know I would travel a little bit, but I'm not going to get on a plane and go wherever the case is. But at least it's nice to uh, get reports in, even if somebody doesn't want it investigated. They want to just throw their story uh, into the pot that we end up putting in a database. And um, more and more, as, as you take over the uh, website, I suppose we'll keep these cases updated and available and people can read um, on uh, API. Uh, we have to do a, a very thorough job of separating out all the uh, information that might identify the witness, right. and then we can publish that report. And, and I think probably what we'll do is we'll we'll create two separate documents: one that's got all the information we're protecting, and all the ones, and the one that has none of that, and then the one that has no protected information goes online, where anyone and hopefully, ultimately we'd like to get all of them on the website where anybody is interested in our cases can. Go and look at the cases and search them, and say, "Was that like my case, yeah. or you know, was that the same time or the same date mm -hmm. as my case?" Uh, and because a lot of people, when they contact us, what they really want to know is, "Did somebody else see this?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of times, we, our answer is, "Well, we'll check," but uh, most likely, the answer is no. Yeah, people want to make sure they aren't crazy. <laughs> Yeah, we see that a lot. People people tell me, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I've had witnesses that had experienced some really, really strange things. Yes, you have. And, and so have you. Y yes, I have. And uh, these people are ordinary salt of the earth, mm -hmm. working people who are completely functional in their lives, except for these weird things that are going on. You know, they're not in institutions. They're not, you know, they're not crazy. They're not receiving psychiatric help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what do you do for somebody who just stumbled into the twilight zone? Well, I don't have any I don't have the answer to that. I'll, but all we can really do is do our best to help them find the facts around their case and show them those facts and say, "Look, this is what we could learn. I'm sorry we don't know more." And and here's say maybe how your case compares to some others, but I I can't absolutely tell you what's going on. And a lot of people are tell me, "I know I know that there's life in outer space and, and it's coming to visit us uh, from my experiences. And I I don't say that that's wrong. I just say, okay, well, that I can't establish as a fact, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> I, I will I will learn as much as I can. Yep. 
And you know, these FOIA requests, I think, are the new frontier as for some of these sightings, but not all of them. Uh, well, well, we do what we can, and and also the other thing is uh, we want to get establish better relationships, not only with other organizations, but also with law enforcement and even uh, even the FAA, and, and have, you know, so that uh, instead of them calling, people call up and say, "Oh, I saw this X Y Z thing." In the sky, a lot of times the the police department will say, "Okay, well, we'll write that down," and but I, we're not going <laughs> to do anything about it. And they can say, "Well, here's a number you can call. That that would be, or here here's a a website, and uh, you know, or an email you can send. And by the way, the email is uh, that I'm going to set up is going to be UFO at aerial dash phenomenon dot org. And if you can send your report directly to that, or you can go on, but we prefer you go online to report a UFO.org and fill out the form. That's the best way right now to get in touch with us. Yeah, and we'll have that information on on links on our podcast notes uh, at the end of this program. So that will be available. All right. Well, I think that's pretty good. Um, Savannah, do you have anything you'd like to add before we uh, end this segment? Uh, Well, I think that if someone has been listening to the podcast for a little while and has been uh, become curious about becoming an investigator and is thinking about sending us an email or whatever, that it's okay to reach out. It took me a little while to to, uh, muster up the courage to email you guys and... Uh, it was a very smooth, fun process to get going, and I'm learning a lot as I go along. Um, my The skills that I felt like I brought to the table were just, I'm highly organized and infinitely curious. You know, I, I'm not, a, I don't specialize in UFOs, and this is sort of my first time diving into this topic. So if there are people out there like that, uh, don't be afraid to shoot us an email that Everyone has a skill. Everyone has something that they can bring to the team. Mm-hmm. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, we'll have all, all the emails in the show notes, too, at, at uh, apicasefiles.com. Well, this brings us to the end of Episode 12 of API Case Files. I've been your host, Marcia Barnhart, and I was joined by my colleague, API Director, Paul Carr, and our new Oregon-based lead investigator, Savannah Dollison. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. Links in the show notes for this episode can be found at apicasefiles.com. The spoken content of API Case Files is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license. All music heard on this podcast is licensed under Creative Commons. This free use with attribution music is deeply appreciated, and we thank the musicians and songwriters for sharing their creative spirit. Featured during this episode were two compositions by Detroit-based Drastic Measures. Our intro theme music is a mashup of Alien Chronicler and Boxcat Games, and DJ Spooky provides our outro theme music. Visit our website at aerial-phenomenon.org. Here you can find out more about our organization, and you can make a UFO report at this site. Just fill out the form provided as completely as you can, and that will generate a report. If you'd like to drop us a line, that would be great. Email director at aerial-phenomenon.org. Meanwhile, thanks for joining us, and we hope you recommend API Case Files and API Conversations to your friends and acquaintances.
This is API Case Files. Case Files. Case Files.